Now we're going to build on what we learned in the Global Energy Balance lectures, as well as the Atmospheric Circulation lectures, in looking at ocean circulation. This is a satellite image of an area near and dear to my heart. I did my master's thesis work here in these blue areas. Bluish green here in Florida Bay, the Florida Keys Reef Track, Great Bahama Bank or Grand Bahama Bank, and Little Bahama Bank here. There are a lot of interesting things about this image that we don't have time to get into. The primary things I want you to take a look at here is the color differentiation. Here we have a very dark blue, almost black ocean. These are the Florida Straits here. This water is about two kilometers deep. The water here in what's known as the tongue of the ocean or the Toto, T-O-T-O, this tongue of the ocean is about a kilometer deep here and about two kilometers deep here. So there's a very rapid drop off from shallow, essentially knee deep water here to over a mile in depth or two kilometers in depth here. Now this difference in depth, which you can see most clearly here, is the cause of the difference in color. The cause of the difference in color in turn is going to result in different characteristics as far as how the water absorbs incoming radiation. Once again, it's all about the incoming radiation and how that radiation that's received in an unequal way on different parts of the Earth's surface is redistributed. And that smoothing out, the redistribution of that energy is what we know as weather. It's also what we know as atmosphere and oceanic circulation. So we're gonna take a look at the movement of water at the ocean surface and also the movement of water with depth below the ocean surface. And it turns out there's two mechanisms that have very different effects on the movement of seawater at those depths, the shallow water versus deep water. So the first thing we'll talk about is the ocean itself, the shape of the ocean basins. The shape of these ocean basins depends on the depth at which you're looking in the ocean, in that individual basin. When we talk about sea level change, most of us think about short-term sea level change. What causes the ocean to get deep? What causes the ocean to get shallow? Perhaps in our lifetimes. The primary way to make the ocean deeper in the short term is the melting of glacial ice. This is ice that sits on the land surface. It's different from sea ice. So we're talking about glacial ice, not sea ice. When that ice melts, it contributes to the global oceans and sea level rises. How do we make sea level decrease? Well, we increase glaciation. During the height of the last ice age, sea level was about 300 feet lower than it is today. That's about 100 meters difference. We're gonna take a look at that in a second. Now for long-term sea level change, we need to think about long-term geological processes like plate tectonics. The size, the shape, and the age of mid-ocean ridges is going to play a role in ocean depth. And the presence or absence of apiric seaways is also going to determine, to a large degree, the ocean depth. And whether information from a given time in the geologic past is stored in some form, whether it's a limestone or some other geologic feature. Here we have a super cool video that shows the depth of the ocean and the influence of the depth of the ocean on what we see at the Earth's surface the land we see exposed. So the ocean's going away here. You can see the scale off to the left indicating the depth. And once we get down to about 6,000 meters depth, there's very little water left. Okay, now the Earth is entirely dry. It's appearing as if it was the surface of Venus, for example, which is now devoid of any water that it had at some point in its past. So we'll start this over again. We're gonna stop it right here at minus 100 meters. So this is sea level about 320, 330 feet lower than it is today. How the Earth would have appeared 
around 20,000 years ago or so. You'll notice some very significant differences, particularly here around Europe. At this time in the geologic past, say 20, 22,000 years ago or so, you could actually walk from Western Ireland, from right here, the Dingle Peninsula. You can walk from Ireland all the way across Asia, down through Indonesia, and with a couple short trips between islands here, you could reach the continent of Australia and then walk all the way to the southern tip of Tasmania. You could walk all the way from Tasmania here to Portugal, or if you prefer, Cape Town, South Africa. All in walking distance, as Stephen Wright said, if you got the time. So this, again, was the height of the last glaciation. People were free to migrate. This is how people made it to a lot of places we see in the modern world that are geographically isolated at this time. They weren't geographically isolated 20,000 years ago. You could walk from place to place. We'll let this run forward a bit. And you'll notice the Earth starting to become less recognizable. Something that should be obvious is the appearance of this mountain range running along the center or near center of the Atlantic Ocean. This mountain range is known as the Mid-Atlantic Rift. It's a mid-ocean ridge. It is the longest mountain range in the world. It runs from near the North Pole to Antarctica, close to Antarctica anyway. And because this rock is younger and hotter, it's more buoyant, it's less dense than the surrounding rock, so it tends to bulge upward. And we'll notice eventually when we talk about longer term, we'll notice eventually when we talk about longer term climate variability that this is going to become significant. The appearance or absence of these large mid-ocean rig systems is going to change the displacement of seawater. It's like Archimedes in his bathtub. You throw somebody in a bathtub, it displaces water, it overflows. The same thing happens in the ocean. So we have Archimedes sitting here in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, displacing this water, raising sea level. But that's a, another story for the next lecture series we get into plate tectonics. So we'll run this forward to the end quickly. You'll see some residual pools of water on the flanks of these ocean ridges. This is old, cold seafloor, and it's cold because it's old. Because it's old, it represents the longest term record we have of marine conditions. And in many cases, it's the longest continuous record we have of climate and environmental change on the Earth. Going back in some parts of the Pacific over here, around 180 million years ago or so. So the oldest seafloor that we can find today is about 180 million years old. Prior to that, we have to look at empiric seaways, inland seaways that accumulate carbonate rock predominantly for our isotope purposes and for climate reconstruction purposes. But you also see empiric seaways like that that covered Saskatchewan. 100 million years ago or so that deposited large amounts of potash. And we'll get into that a little bit later in the course as well. So as we let this go forward and we remove more and more water, eventually we're only going to be left with a few narrow bands of water, such as here, the Puerto Rican Trench, uh, over here in the Pacific, the Marianas Trench. These are going to represent the deepest water on Earth today. In the case of the Marianas Trench, we get down to around 36,000 foot of seawater. And we'll just run the rest of the water off the planet. And we've gone completely dry now. We'll come back to these plate tectonic issues in the next lecture series. We can put this in personal terms by discussing ocean circulation as if we were in a current running from, say, the Department of Geological Sciences to Walmart on Clarence. So we'll take a look at a map here of Saskatoon. 
And under normal circumstances, you would board a bus here at Science Place. You would travel down College Drive, and then you would take a left on Clarence and go straight to Walmart, although you'd have to walk for a bit. But if we change the depth of the ocean, we remove some seawater, barricades start to appear. Now we can no longer take Clarence. Clarence is shut down because they're replacing all the old water pipes. 8th Street is shut down because of maybe some power issues or a sewer blew up, which I saw a few years ago. Now the other streets are closing down and you have to skydive into Walmart's Supercenter parking lot in order to reach the store. This is what's happening in the ocean basins for deep currents. These deep currents don't have the same conduits, they don't have the same freedom that the surface waters do. So they have to adhere to the topography that we can't see that lies below the surface of the ocean. Starting at the surface, we can see that atmospheric circulation is directly tied to ocean circulation in distributing the world's energy budget. When the wind blows, the water moves, essentially. So we can see in this image a plot of the major wind-driven currents around the world. These currents are forced or pushed directly by the atmosphere. So starting here in the North Atlantic, we have the trade winds blowing to the west. These are the easterlies, the southeast trade winds. They're going to push the water along with them towards the west. When we reach the western boundary, of this ocean circulation pattern that we'll call a gyre, we see the direction of the water circulation changing. It switches from westerly to northerly, and then ultimately it's going to be entrained by the westerlies, which are blowing to the east at these mid-latitudes. These westerlies are going to push this ocean gyre to the east, and once it reaches the European continent and West Africa, it's going to be deflected to the south, and it's going to continue with this pattern that's forced by the atmospheric circulation. Easterly trade winds here, mid-latitude westerlies up here. Same thing goes in the Pacific, and in the Southern Hemisphere, the opposite scenario takes place because the winds are blowing in the opposite directions at specific latitudes in the Southern Hemisphere. And these are known as the major wind-driven currents. Circulation in the ocean is different than that of the atmosphere in a couple different ways, very important ways though. Again, we see a map here of the globe, in this case with some of these gyres named. These gyres may have spin-offs that become subsidiary currents. In this case, the North Atlantic gyre has a Gulf Stream component that most of us are familiar with. This Gulf Stream is going to work its way from the warm tropical waters, semi-tropical waters of the Caribbean, to the high latitudes off of Maritime Canada. It's deflected to the east, and then it bifurcates. It splits into the Norwegian current, or the North Atlantic Drift as it's known, and it becomes the Canary Current flowing to the south. Now we have another current up here, the Ermiker Current, which is warm water that splits going to the east and to the west of Iceland, which is this island here. And that's colliding with this cold, deeper water East Greenland current that's moving to the south, ultimately joining up with the cold, deeper Labrador current that moves past Labrador here. This is what generates what's known as Iceberg Alley. Icebergs coming off of Greenland and to a lesser degree up here in Canada, getting entrained in these currents and forced south. So if you visit Newfoundland, you can often see icebergs cruising by the coast. That's just kind of neat. What's driving this difference in circulation? The primary thing that's driving this difference is that the atmosphere is heated from below and the ocean is heated from above, with 90% of insulation absorbed in the upper 100 meters. That's not a typo. The atmosphere is heated from below the ocean is heated from above. This energy is going to be stored somehow, and we're going to see where it's stored in a moment. So what does this mean, heated from below? Well, the atmosphere is basically transparent to incoming insulation that has relatively short wavelengths, relatively high frequency insulation, travels through this transparent atmosphere, strikes the Earth's surface, is absorbed with 100% efficiency because the Earth is a black body, 
and then it's re-emitted at a longer wavelength. In this case, because of the Earth's average temperature, that wavelength is going to max out in the infrared range. The Earth's surface is heating the atmosphere from below. The ocean is receiving insulation from above. That insulation is traveling as far as it can into the ocean, but most of it's going to be absorbed in the upper 100 meters. And anyone that's gone snorkeling or scuba diving can tell you that when you look down in a column of water, it gets dark. If you dive down 50, 100 feet, say 30 meters, most of the light goes away. You're going to want to bring an auxiliary light with you, a flashlight of some type. Once this water is warmed, again, most of the heat is going to be absorbed in the upper portion of the water, the upper 100 meters. This means the ocean heat content, the storage of this energy, is going to be concentrated in the upper layers of water. In this case, it's divided between 0 to 700, 700 to 2,000 meters depth. So 0 to a little over a half a kilometer depth and half a kilometer to two kilometers depth are the two categories here. Most of the heat that's retained by the Earth from the sun is retained in the upper 700 meters of the ocean. A significant proportion of that heat is going to be stored in deeper water from 700 to 2,000 meters depth and below. And then what we're familiar with, the land, ice at the poles, near the poles, Greenland and Antarctica, the ice caps on Iceland, again, the surface features, and the atmosphere just above the Earth's surface, is going to store some heat, but comparatively little. Most of this heat is produced in the infrared range, and it's emitted into the atmosphere to heat the atmosphere. The atmosphere then circulates that energy, and it's ultimately going to be removed from the Earth system at about the same rate it's received. Another thing to consider in terms of circulation of the ocean is the influence of temperature on the water density. We'll start out with a simple scenario here, fresh water. In freshwater lakes, such as the lakes here in Canada, we see a division during the summer of three different levels. We have the epilimnion here, we have the metalimnion here, and the hypolimnion here. These different layers of water are going to circulate somewhat independent of each other. At the surface, you dive into a lake in northern Saskatchewan in the summer, late summer usually, that water is going to feel relatively warm right here at the surface. If you hold your breath and swim down three, four meters, it'll be dramatically colder. And if you were to continue on down to the bottom of the lake, then you probably wouldn't need to go very far. You would hit water that's about four degrees centigrade. So maybe 20, 24 degrees at the surface and about four in the deeper water. So the net result is during a season, we'll say uh, we start in the winter time when the lake is ice covered, we see the temperature decreasing to about zero right at the surface, right beneath the ice, increasing to about four degrees quickly below the ice, and then maintaining a steady temperature all the way to the bottom of the lake of about four degrees. That's the temperature of maximum density of fresh water, normal Earth's surface pressures. During the fall and spring turnover, when the lake mixes from the top to the bottom, the temperature has to be isothermic, about the same from the top to the bottom. Usually this takes place when the water reaches a temperature of around 10 to 12 degrees or so. In the summertime, the lake is stabilized because warmer water is less dense than colder water, and this surface water will continue to get warmer and warmer as long as the air stays warm, as long as the lake is receiving significant insulation and the mixing isn't too great. Because of this warming though, the mixing tends to be limited to near the surface. Eventually we're going to reach a place in the lake, depth-wise, where the temperature changes. There's an incline in the temperature versus depth. So we'll call that a thermocline. So the thermocline is a tilt in the thermal record with depth. So no thermocline, it would be isothermic, same temperature all the way to the bottom. With a thermocline, we have 25 degrees at the surface, temperature decreasing substantially within the thermocline until we reach the hypolimnion, 
where the temperature is probably going to reach uh, a low of about four degrees again. So this is a simple scenario. This is what we see in freshwater. The ocean is different though. There's something about the ocean that changes this thing, throws it on its head, and that's salt. The presence of salt, of dissolved solids, of ions, increases the density of water. Seawater is denser than fresh water. Because warmer surface water is less dense than cooler water, this increases stability if the water is fresh. If the water is not fresh, as most of the water in the world, then the surface heating is also going to increase evaporation. When water evaporates, the water molecules go away, the dissolved solids stay behind. The net result is the water becomes more salty, more saline, and therefore more dense. The thermal inertia of the ocean prevents it from responding directly to changing insulation on a small scale the way that air is affected. So here we have a playa, an extreme evaporative environment. And you can see that the evaporation has proceeded to a point where salt crystals are forming in the water or adjacent to these pools of water. If left alone, this would all turn into a solid beach of salt at some point. Well, it looks like fairly soon. This could be Death Valley. I'm not actually sure. It sure looks like Death Valley. You have a big alluvial fan here of weathered feldspars coming out of these granitic rocks. At least that's what it looks like to me. And in dissolving these feldspars, you free up a lot of ions. These ions make their way into the lake here. This lake evaporates and those ions precipitate as salts. So they start out as feldspars, they end up as halides or salt crystals here. 